confined within the walls of a South African jail. The young lawyer from India found no reason to complain. Some say that jail is a palace. Others look upon it as a beautiful garden. Some others hold that through the jail gates, we shall pass from our present bondage to freedom. The year was 1907. The young lawyer from India was Mohandas Gandhi. Gandhi led his fellow Indians in a non-violent struggle against racial oppression for eight years. They marched into forbidden territory. They burned their registration papers. They expected to be arrested, and they were not disappointed. Gandhi said, non-violent refusal to cooperate with injustice is the way to defeat it. He gave his non-violent weapon a name, Satyagraha, holding to truth. In every decade and on every continent, underdogs have taken up Gandhi's strategies to fight for their rights and freedom. Nonviolence means fighting back, but you're fighting back with other weapons. The power that Gandhi discovered changed the 20th century. Last year, news of black youth shot by police has become as common as the weather report. It's been called an uprising. Millions of black South Africans have intensified their struggle for equality, an end to the legalized discrimination called apartheid. Security forces have become newly aggressive in the black townships, a provocative target for angry young people. Even innocent bystanders are being caught in the deadly cycle of rising violence. And all the casualties are on one side. Appalled by the bloodshed, a new generation of township leaders is organizing, looking for more effective ways to fight back. Now, are, this unhealthy situation here at Kubega. In Port Elizabeth, the 27-year-old Mukaseli Jack has been a youth organizer since his teens. There was a frustration in the township as to what was happening. There was a serious confrontation with young people fighting with the police with their bare hands, you know, and police shooting at them without mercy. And then he said, let us expose these policemen for what they are. Let us take this fight in the townships away and bring it right to their homes. Two miles away, most whites in Port Elizabeth are unaware of the strife. White-owned newspapers and state-controlled television do not report township disturbances. But a handful of whites have joined the anti-apartheid movement. One of them is Janet Cherry, a young social worker who has been an underground member of the outlawed African National Congress since college days. The idea was that we've got to take the struggle into the white areas not because of any racist motive, but because of that understanding that the state wasn't in fact vulnerable 
unless you made an impact outside of the townships. The black civic movement has been growing. In 1983, the United Democratic Front was created as a national umbrella for over 600 local civics. Street committees, church groups, sports teams, women's clubs. As this organization broadened and broadened and broadened and broadened, it became extremely difficult for the security forces to crush these people because now you have big centers of resistance within the community. And then slowly, you started everybody to include him in the struggle for justice. And slowly, everyone saw his role. In May 1985, several middle-aged women approached leaders of the Port Elizabeth Black Civic Organization to suggest a boycott of white business. A consumer boycott has the potential to achieve Mukaseli Jack's objective, to put pressure on the white community for the first time. Boycott organizers have only a few weeks to prepare. Half a million people must be persuaded to shop inside the township. The preparation was to tell, the, to bring uh, the business, black business people in the townships and tell them that we want them to stock the basic necessities that will be needed for this long drawn struggle that we're going to face. Weekly funerals, the only public gatherings not prohibited by the government, are their only opportunity to rally support for the boycott. We want a government, a government based on the will and wishes of the people. We want a government. Two days before the boycott will begin, Mukseli Jack is the main speaker. And I'm going to say, they can take us to jail. On Monday, to the detail. Monday is the day. Monday is the day. Monday is the day. We will bind down on Monday. We will bind down on Monday. We will bind in the box of Monday on Monday. It looks the same as any other morning. But by 10 a.m., the difference is obvious. The North End, normally jammed with black shoppers, is deserted. Observers sent to monitor the boycott report 100% compliance. The boycott is the latest tactic in a 10-month uprising. But in only five days, it has proven the most effective weapon yet. And it is spreading elsewhere. A genuine threat to the apartheid regime. This state of affairs can no longer be tolerated. The government has, in terms of the Public Security Act, Act 3 of 1953, decided to proclaim a state of emergency in the following magisterial districts. Port Elizabeth, Albany, Udenaik, Cranock, Kirkwood, Somerset East, Adelaide, Port Wavert, Bedford, Alexandria. The South African Army occupies the townships. Travel is restricted. Night and day curfews are imposed. Hundreds are arrested. Young males are singled out for brutality. But repression does not diminish the boycott. Security forces have little success rounding up the leaders. Most are anonymous outside their own neighborhoods, dispersed among dozens of street committees and civics. If they declare a state of emergency, they were panicking because they were, we were becoming effective 
They were feeling us coming. They were feeling us coming. So to us, the state of emergency showed that extraordinary measures were to be implemented in order to keep apartheid alive. And we knew then that we got apartheid in a crisis. And we were there, we were there to give it the push, to push, to push. Right in the first three weeks, shops began to, to close. Can you believe it? It was freedom celebration. When we heard that one shop was closing, we just celebrated, thank you. And then the other one, please come, thank you. Mukseli Jack goes into hiding to avoid arrest. Moving from house to house, he consults with the boycott committee on how to exploit their success. They add new conditions to the demands which must be met before they will lift the boycott. We had uh, concrete demands, and these demands dealt in those days with uh, simple things when you look at them today. Uh, like uh, opening of uh, public amenities or facilities to all races, uh, taking out of the troops from the township, making this available, whatever was not available, and end discrimination in the workplace, etc. And uh, we also had uh, what we call long term at the time, you know, like talking about Mandela's freedom was like, oh my goodness. This is something, my child, because the other people will discourage us about this. No, nah, no, nah, leave that. That's impossible. We, we waited until the pain went into the bones. Otherwise, what was the strike for? We waited, we took our time, because we were losing nothing, and they were losing hundreds of, of rents. And then the Chamber of Commerce ultimately said, we have to talk to them. Uh, many of the demands we have, most of the demands, in fact, we have every sympathy with. After meeting with Jack and the boycott leaders, the Chamber of Commerce director talks with reporters. Uh, yes, there are demands which, uh, which we can address directly, and those we obviously will. There are others which have to be addressed by the government, and we feel there that it's our duty and responsibility. Jack has been a well-known youth leader for several years. Now his role as boycott spokesman has made him a serious threat to the regime. He was an extreme troublemaker, <laughs> an activist uh, in the true sense of the word, yes. Colonel Lawrence Duplessis was chief of military intelligence for the Eastern Cape province. They're not really committing a crime. <laughs> like you said earlier, if, if they don't want to buy, it's not a crime if they don't want to buy from people, but it's, it's mass action. And, and what do you do? You can't shoot all these people, you can't lock them all up. It's very effective. Like, well, Gandhi started it, if I'm not <laughs> wrong, passive resistance. When security forces realize the boycott is not disintegrating, they decide to take action. On the night of August the 2nd, Mukaseli Jack and the boycott leaders are arrested and taken to St. Albans prison. Once the government decided to throw everyone in jail, and you recall that, how about 30,000 people who were thrown into jails in terms of the state of emergency of 1985. Once you remove the leaders, you create even greater conditions of desperation. And you can have a situation of mayhem. And this is what, you know, the state had pushed South Africa into. Spontaneous outbursts by angry young people now jeopardize the movement. <laughs> Among the few courageous enough to warn of the danger is a South African churchman, Bishop Desmond Tutu.
which can stand the scrutiny, the harsh scrutiny of history. By keeping Mukseli Jack and his comrades behind bars, the regime is preventing negotiations that could end the crippling boycott. By September, Port Elizabeth retailers are desperate. Jack suddenly has powerful white allies. I mean, a respected businessman going, now looking for these people that have been described as, uh, as hooligans and as uh, thugs. Now the businessman says, these leaders got legitimate grievances. If they have committed a crime, take them in front of a court of law and try them and find them guilty or innocent. Don't just lock them up. The boycott enters its fourth month. Thousands of blacks are still coming to their jobs in white-owned shops, but they buy nothing. White businessmen have been negotiating a deal. The boycott will be suspended if the businessmen can arrange for the black leaders to be released. We were not intending to antagonize these white people, but our idea was just to drive our point home. And uh, you see, when we stop it, of course also, it served two purposes. The pressure on our constituency to go and shop for Christmas was going to lead to some cracks within our own uh, ranks. So we hit two birds with one stone, saved those people, and also kept our unity intact for the next fight. The Christmas shopping season is back to normal as businessmen begin serious negotiations with the boycott committee. Mukseli Jack and his colleagues have set a deadline. If their demands are not met by March 31st, the boycott will be reimposed. Their short-term successes have given Port Elizabeth's blacks a sense of confidence. Their leaders have been released from prison and troops have been withdrawn. But as the deadline approaches with no progress on their major political demands, they prepare a new boycott. Unexpectedly on March 11th, the government bans two civic leaders. One of them is Mukseli Jack. The banning order is a form of house arrest, which halts negotiations. At that point, uh, there was uh, a build-up of international pressure, build-up, exposing that this was no more apartheid, small apartheid. It was complete fascism, because almost every paper was banned, every individual was banned. And if you remember that time, you were major corporations were running away. You know, it was embarrassing. Economic sanctions against South Africa are being debated in the US and Europe. Most governments are resisting, saying that state-imposed sanctions would hurt ordinary people more than the government. But now, as black South Africans call on Western governments to impose punitive sanctions, an exodus begins led by AT&T, IBM, GE, Ford, General Motors, and Coca-Cola. March 22nd, a Supreme Court justice lifts the ban on Mukseli Jack, saying the government has given insufficient reasons. The victory energizes the movement, just nine days before the new boycott is scheduled. Jack tears up his banning orders, using the celebration to cement the solidarity they will need in the weeks ahead. We are trusting that we are, bring, we are going to bring water down in his knees. Our buying power, our buying power is going to be the thing that is going to decide the future, that is going to decide our destiny in this country. It is clear, the first of April, we know we will not buy him in the bubble gum the town.
The boycott is on. It will continue for nine weeks. And then, a shock. Security forces scour the black townships, arresting thousands. The government has secretly imposed a state of emergency. For hours, police raid the offices of black civics, trade unions, the UDF, the South African Council of Churches, arresting and confiscating documents. Peaceful protesters at the parliament buildings are dispersed and arrested. Damage to 11 church buildings 16 hours after the crackdown started, President Berta speaks in parliament. He cites intelligence reports on the imminent threat of armed revolution by the ANC and Communist Party. These revolutionaries are controlled by a power clique which is typical of Marxist regimes and which is interested only in a violent takeover of power. It is not possible for the reasonable majority to continue the search for a peaceful and democratic solution. It is the second state of emergency in less than a year. The emergency will be renewed every year for three years an admission that repression has become the primary function of the state. Anti-apartheid forces are driven underground, but not destroyed. They have not brought the government down, but non-violent mass action has shattered its legitimacy. The system of apartheid is no longer viable. Power has shifted to black communities and their social organizations. The end of apartheid is only a matter of time. You know, there wasn't a, a, a principled stand against the use of violence, and in fact, it was widely acknowledged that the ANC was, he was conducting the armed struggle. But it was, in fact, the activities of the UDF in mass organization which brought about the change in South Africa, really, that it was that, form, that mass organization which put pressure on the state to ultimately to change. I mean, that, that brought about the, the stalemate, the impasse where the state could no longer respond. The eyes of the world are presently focused on all South Africans. F.W. de Klerk becomes no president in late 1989 after P.W. Bota is forced to resign. De Klerk acts quickly, unbanning political organizations and ordering the release of Nelson Mandela, who has been imprisoned for 27 years. By refusing to renounce armed struggle, Mandela has prolonged his imprisonment by years. During that time, the passivity that had once allowed apartheid to exist has been swept away by the spirit of a confident civil society. Well, the armed struggle uh, came to nothing as far as I'm concerned. The people, the people brought it about. And pressure from overseas, that is what really, uh, in the end, made it clear and people understood that we couldn't go on, on any... That's why the clerk had to take the actions that he took. In 1993, Nelson Mandela and F.W. de Klerk share the Nobel Peace Prize for negotiating a constitution that guarantees equal rights for all South Africans. They will soon face each other in South Africa's first democratic elections. Him against me, him, him for you, Father, appealing, asking for peace in the rest of the country. Lord of Lords, we him, him for you, Father, appealing, 
has been for peace in the rest of the country. They have never in their lives voted, nor have their parents or their grandparents before them. Reveal yourself, reveal yourself. Reveal yourself, reveal yourself. Reveal yourself, reveal from heaven. The struggle against apartheid, against the racism in South Africa, fundamentally had been non-violent. We were inspired by what had happened in India, in, in Poland, in the civil rights movement uh, in the United States, what was happening in the Philippines. I suppose that human beings l looking at it would say that um, arms, arms are the most dangerous things. Uh, that a, a, a dictator, a tyrant, uh, needs to fear. But in fact, no. It is when people decide they want to be free. Once they have made up that, their minds to that, there's nothing that will stop them. Spring, 1983. For nearly 10 years, General Augusto Pinochet has ruled Chile unchallenged. We needed someone to dare to say to the dictator that he was a dictator, and to say that the dictatorship was a dictatorship, and confront it on its own turf. Not on the turf of arms, just to dare to tell them that what we had in Chile was wrong, and that it had to be changed. Pinochet came to power in a 1973 coup that left the elected socialist president, Salvador Allende, dead. During the first months of the military regime, the number of people detained in prisons reached more than 40,000. At least 3,000 individuals were assassinated, executed, or their bodies disappeared forever. Ruthlessly eliminating any challenge to his authority, Pinochet's rule cast fear into every corner of Chilean life. It was a very permeating paranoia, and it was with everyone. Everybody had experienced some sort of oppression in their family, and they were very cautious. My husband and I would go to a social gathering, and he wouldn't introduce me to anyone. And I said, well, well, why won't you introduce me to people? And he said, oh, we don't do that now. It's too dangerous. You really, you don't really want to know people's names. Fear, terror, if you have a people afraid, you can control them. And Pinochet, if something he will leave in history, he's the man of terror. Executions, disappearances, and prisons keep the dictatorship in power for 10 years. By 1983, a severe economic crisis has pushed unemployment to 30%. As Chileans feel they have nothing left to lose, open opposition to the regime becomes thinkable for the first time. The first signs of opposition appear at the heart of Chile's economy, in the copper mines of the Andes Mountains.
Miners are amongst Chile's best paid workers in the country's largest and most lucrative export industry. Their leader is 29-year-old Rodolfo Seguel, a payroll clerk at Chile's largest copper mine, recently elected president of the National Labor Congress. Seguel wants his members to take the first step, a nationwide strike. Ten years had gone by and nobody had gone out into the street. We had to see what reaction the country would have and then to see if the country would dare to do this. Our goal was to open people's eyes and to tell them, we can do it, it is possible, we can do this. A week before the strike is to begin, Pinochet's troops surround the copper mines. Seguel knows that there will be bloodshed if the strike goes forward. They change their plans. Instead of a strike, they proclaim a national day of protest. With only a few days to prepare, they must mobilize not just union members, but the whole population. I remember that morning. At the beginning, you didn't know if someone was walking slowly, driving his car slowly, or walking slowly on the sidewalk, because he was just taking a walk or because they were protesting. Until finally at noon, it was so obvious. It was so obvious that everything was slower. It was so evident that the city started to close down. As darkness falls, no one knows whether the final overt act of protest will succeed. At exactly 8 p.m., it begins, tentatively at first. And the next day, there was a sense of sort of, what did you do last night? Did you see it? Oh yes, I was out banging my pots and pans with my neighbors. And so there was a real sense of, of complicity all of a sudden in a society where each human being had literally become a complete island. And the next day, when the protest finished, at the first meeting that we had, we decided to have a protest every month. And we did that during nine or ten months. Every month a protest. And that was chaos for the military regime, because we didn't protest with arms. That gave us more power. A mood approaching euphoria grows as the protests grow every month. People start to believe that mass demonstrations alone will bring down the dictatorship. Extreme opposition protests are strictly non-violent. Brutal police repression of the monthly demonstrations seems intended to intimidate, to stop the movement. But it has no effect. In early August, one day before the fourth protest is scheduled, Pinochet installs a new interior minister, Sergio Harpa. Harpa is instructed to begin a dialogue with the opposition. In a contradictory gesture on the same day, Pinochet deploys thousands of troops in the streets of the capital. An ominous prelude to the next day's demonstrations.
security forces break up the August protest with unprecedented force. A police statement admits that 17 civilians have been killed. The actual number is much higher. It was very violent. And that's when I realized that we couldn't keep on going down this road. Because the violence was too strong. Pinochet had 16,000 soldiers on the streets of Santiago. More than 80 people were killed, and the population started to rebel. Shocked by the bloodshed, the new Cardinal of Chile's Catholic Church offers to host the dialogue that Pinochet has promised. At the first meeting, Gabriel Valdez told me that he had to give me a document. And I told him that I would not take this document because it is an agreement that you drew up this morning, demanding the resignation of the President of the Republic. That you don't recognize him as being legitimate. And if the President of the Republic is not the legitimate President, I have nothing to do here, because I represent him. So this is where it all ends, right here. As Pinochet celebrates his birthday in November, he has stopped Sergio Harper's meetings with the opposition. Harper's small concessions, limited political activity, the return of exiles, an end to book censorship, were too much for the general. The dialogue is over. No, 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 there wasn't any result. It was very frustrating. The regime didn't change at all. And Harpa himself was left there as a politician with no importance. In fact, the control of the government passed on to much harder hands. Opposition groups have been naive to think that Pinochet would negotiate an end to his own power. Protesters have not loosened the dictator's grip, but they have shown Pinochet they cannot be crushed by force, and they have opened up political space they will use to organize against him. Viva Chile! In late November 1985, Half a million attend the largest political rally in Chilean history. Amigos, amigos. Gabriel Valdez speaks for 11 opposition parties and the Catholic Church. The National Accord, formed to lead a non-violent transition to democracy. Valdez warns, if we don't support the National Accord, we are heading towards civil war. In Chile's poor neighborhoods, the Poblaciones, a low-intensity war has already begun. Hard times have fallen hardest here, making fertile ground for Chile's Marxist and Communist parties. Not many have personally taken up arms, but the ideology of violent revolution is accepted. The regime sees the Poblaciones as enemy territory. Young men in the Poblaciones are rounded up, interrogated in stadiums and fields, and hauled off to prison without trial. Hundreds are never seen again. Pinochet's human rights abuses have drawn the normally conservative Catholic Church into the conflict. Though the clergy takes no political position, the church protests against the torture, killings, and disappearances, and preaches nonviolent methods. If you use violence, then you have to have the force to defend yourself. Whatever you impose through violence, you have to defend through violence. That's why we think that violence is the strength of the weak, because they don't have arguments. 
They don't have moral authority. So whatever you achieve through violence, you have to defend through violence. Monthly protests turn violent as the radicals confront police, handing Pinochet the excuse he needs to come down on all opposition. Mainstream factions are harshly criticized for their non-violent methods. In those conditions when you are repressed by violence, of course there are people that think that the only way to face violence is through violence. But that was, in our understanding, absolutely out of any possibility of succeeding. In late summer of 1986, the prospect of full-scale civil war becomes real. Chilean intelligence uncovers a cache of arms in the northern desert and traces them to a guerrilla group affiliated with the Chilean Communist Party. Markings show the weapons have come from Cuba. Pinochet says it's proof that his opponents are preparing a revolution. A few weeks later, heavily armed guerrillas attacked General Pinochet's motorcade on a remote mountain road. State news media report that five presidential guards have died, but do not mention Pinochet. Four hours later, the dictator appears on television to describe the attack. He appears unfazed by his narrow escape and returns to the presidential palace with his customary swagger. The episode reinforces his image of invincibility. It really polarized, I think, between, you know, are we going to go for a really serious ar attempt at armed struggle, uh, the way we've seen in Central America, with a huge toll on human lives and suffering that was part of that? Uh, or are we going to try to find some other way, which was very nebulous, and so this search began to find some way that could provide some kind of an exit from this impasse. Pinochet's own constitution calls for a plebiscite in 1988, giving Chileans the right to vote yes or no to another eight years of military government. Isolated and overconfident, Pinochet always assumed he would win. But after five years of organizing, the non-violent opposition sees an opportunity. For the first time, we knew that if Pinochet was going to remain in power, there's going to be a plebiscite, and you have to say yes or no. Therefore, we say, look, if we prepare ourselves, we can defeat Pinochet saying no. And we said, how are we going to trust the dictator that has been doing all these things, and he will count the votes, that he count the votes as, as the votes are? But we realized that we had no other way. And we said, let's move ahead in that direction and let's create all the conditions to avoid any fraud. Thousands of volunteers take to the countryside in a door-to-door -door campaign to convince Chileans that they can vote no without fear of reprisal and that the results will not be rigged. They are greeted with suspicion and skepticism. To create the appearance of a fair vote, Pinochet and the generals write new election laws. Any opposition party that can collect 35,000 signatures will be allowed to have poll watchers, a critical factor to prevent vote fraud, and be given 15 minutes of television time every night for four weeks before the voting. And I said, look, if you register, I'm going to be on TV. And the day that I'm going to be in TV, I will say to Mr. Pinochet that he has to go. After his party is certified, Lagos gets his chance when he appears on the Chilean equivalent of Meet the Press. He holds up a newspaper clipping in which Pinochet is quoted saying he will not be a candidate in the plebiscite. Otros ocho años, con tortura, con asesinatos, con violación de derechos humanos. Me parece inadmisible que un chileno tenga tanta ambición de poder de pretender estar 25 años en el poder. 
His daring performance makes Ricardo Lagos a celebrity overnight. And his performance foreshadows the significance of television in the coming No campaign. Pinochet's vulnerability is human rights. The No campaign plans television spots to emphasize torture, death and prison. But US political consultants advise them that dwelling on the fears of the past would be a turnoff. They developed a, a campaign uh, that was future-oriented, um, a campaign that focused uh, on uh, bread and butter issues, um, uh, and, um, and it was a campaign that ultimately uh, caught the Pinochet regime and the supporters of the yes vote by complete surprise when it was aired on the first night in that, in, in that last 30 days of the campaign. That no, what was meaning yes to democracy was meaning yes to more social justice and not no to injustice. And la alegría ya viene, meaning joy is around the corner. It was an invitation to a country that belonged to everyone. The idea that we were going to defeat the dictatorship, not with a gun, but a pencil. That this road was going to be traveled without hate, without rancor, without vengeance. On television, the No campaign is a sensation. Images of a bright future without Pinochet. The TV spots earn credibility with skeptical viewers with compelling references to the suffering inflicted by the dictatorship. People used to rush home to watch those spots. I used to wa rush home to watch those spots. It was like, you know, 15 minutes where, you know, they use real words to say real things, you know. Torture is torture, and, and it happened here. And after all these years of denial, there it was for the first time on television. Poverty exists. Buenos dias, Don Aníbal. Deme dos marraquetas. Little old ladies don't even have enough money in their purses to buy a tea bag for their afternoon tea. Voy a llevar té también. Cómo no. Dos bolsitas. Una nomás. No más miseria. de este minuto para el diario de cooperativa dice que a muy pocas horas de que se inicie el plebiscito en Chile voto no no voto sí Opposition poll watchers now perform a parallel vote count based on sampling techniques. By fax and telephone, the numbers are fed to computers in Santiago. By early evening, they project the no has won decisively. A small independent radio station announces the results. Ensconced in the presidential palace, Pinochet says nothing. Suspicions of electoral fraud grow as hours pass with no announcement of the vote tally. At midnight, Pinochet's Navy, Air Force and police commanders enter the palace. General Fernando Matei, Air Force commander, tells reporters. It appears the no has won. A public statement that warns Pinochet to accept the defeat. Within seconds, his remarks are on the radio. At 
the great strength was that it did really come from ordinary, extraordinary people. And they really did put their lives on the line and they really did come out and they really were willing to take a stand. I think that we are in the world, we really live on power. And what we would like to is to live on authority, personal authority, moral authority. When you act based on power, well, if I have a gun pointed at me, uh, I'm going to say whatever you think and you want. After you take your gun off my head, I'm going to do what I want. How people lived that moment. And they lived it without hatred, convinced that they had been the participants, the actors. Here there was no charismatic leader, no guerrilla, no vanguard that would say, I did this. The sense in Chile that night was that they had done it themselves. How many? Seven million.